Company H by Sam R. Watkins, Part 4 out of 5. To go up on a high place with your sweetheart, and hear her say, La, ain't it B-E-U-T-I-F-U-L, now, now? Please don't go there, and how you walk up pretty close to the edge and spit over. To show what a brave man you are, it's bully, I tell you. Well, I wanted to go to the top of the capital I went, wanted to go up in the cupola. Now, there was an iron ladder running up across an empty space, and you could see two hundred feet below from this cupola or dome on top. The ladder was about ten feet long, spanning the dome. It was very easy to go up, because I was looking up all the time, and I was soon on top of the building. I saw how far I could see, and saw the Alabama River, winding and turning until it seemed no larger than a silver thread. Well, I am very poor at describing and going into ecstasies over fancies. I want some abler pen to describe the scene. I was not thinking about the scene or the landscape. I was thinking how I was going to get down that ladder again. I would come to that iron ladder and peep over, and think if I fell, how far would I have to fall? The more I thought about going down that ladder, the more I didn't feel like going down. Well, I felt that I had rather die than go down that ladder. I am honest in this. I felt like jumping off and committing suicide rather than go down that ladder. I crossed right over the frightful chasm, but when forbearance ceased to be a virtue, I tremblingly put my foot on the first rung, then grabbed the top of the two projections. There I remained, I don't know how long, but after a while I reached down with one foot and touched the next rung. After getting that foot firmly placed, I ventured to risk the other foot. It was thus for several backward steps, until I come to see down away down, down, down below me, and my head got giddy. The world seemed to be turning round and round. A fellow at the bottom hallowed, Look up, look up, mister, look up. I was not a foot from the upper floor. As soon as I looked at the floor, everything got steady. I kept my eyes fixed on the top of the building and soon made the landing on terra firma. I have never liked high places since. I never could bear to go upstairs in a house. I went to the capital at Nashville last winter, and Mick Andrews wanted me to go up in the cupola with him. He went and paid a quarter for the privilege. I stayed, and well, if I could estimate its value by dollars, I would say two hundred and fifty million dollars is what I made by staying down. Am arrested. The next day, while the ferryboat was crossing the river, I asked the ferryman to let me ride over. I was halted by a soldier who knowed his business. Your pass, sir. Well, I have no pass. Well, sir, I will have to arrest you and take you before the provost marshal. Very well, sir, I will go with you to the provost or anywhere else. I appear before the provost marshal. What command do you belong to, sir? Well, sir, I belong to Company H, 1st Tennessee Regiment. I am a wounded man sent to the hospital. Well, sir, that's too thin. Why did you not get a pass? I did not think one was required. Give me your name, sir. 
I gave my name, Sergeant. Take this name to the hospital and ask if such name is registered on their books. I told him that I knew it was not. The sergeant returns and reports no such name when he remarks, You have to go to the guard house. Says I, Colonel, I knew his rank was that of captain if you send me to the guard house. You will do me a great wrong. Here is where I was wounded. I pulled off my shoe and began to unbandage. Well, sir, I don't want to look at your foot, and I have no patience with you. Take him to the guard house. Turning back, I said, Sir, I, I, you are clothed with a little brief authority and appear to be presuming pretty heavy on that authority. But, sir, well, I have forgotten what I did say. The sergeant took me by the arm and said, Come, come, sir, I have my orders. As I was going up the street, I met Captain Dave Buckner and told him all the circumstances of my arrest as briefly as I could. He said, Sergeant, bring him back with me to the provost marshal's office. They were as mad as wet hens. Their faces were burning, and I could see their jugular veins go thump, thump. Thump. I do not know what Captain Buckner said to them. All I heard were the words otherwise insulted me. But I was liberated, and was glad of it. Those girls. I then went back to the river, and gave a fellow two dollars to row me over the ferry. I was in no particular hurry, and limped along at my leisure until about nightfall, when I came to a nice, cozy-looking farmhouse, and asked to stay all night. I was made very welcome, indeed. There were two very pretty girls here, and I could have loved either were t'other dear charmer away. But I fell in love with both of them, and thereby overdid the thing. This was by a dim fire light. The next day was Sunday, and we all went to church in the country. We went in an old rockaway carriage. I remember that the preacher used the words, Oh, God, nineteen times in his prayer. I had made up my mind which one of the girls I would marry. Now, don't get mad, fair reader mine. I was all gallantry and smiles, and when we arrived at home, I jumped out and took hold the hand of my fair charmer to help her out. She put her foot out, and well, I came very near telling she tramped on a cat. The cat squalled, the talisman. But then you know, reader, that I was engaged to Jenny, and I had a talisman in my pocket Bible in the way of a love letter, against the charms of other beautiful and interesting young ladies. Uncle Jimmy Reeves had been to Maury County, and, on returning to Atlanta, found out that I was wounded and in the hospital at Montgomery, and brought the letter to me, and, as I am married now, I don't mind telling you what was in the letter. If you won't laugh at me, you see, Jenny was my sweetheart, and here is my sweetheart's letter. My dear Sam, I write to tell you that I love you yet, and you alone, 
and day by day I love you more and pray every night and morning for your safe return home again. My greatest grief is that we heard you were wounded and in the hospital, and I cannot be with you to nurse you. We heard of the death of many noble and brave men at Atlanta, and the death of Captain Carthel, cousin Mary's husband. It was sent by Captain January. He belonged to the 12th Tennessee, of which Colonel Watkins was lieutenant colonel. The weather is very beautiful here, and the flowers in the garden are in full bloom, and the apples are getting ripe. I have gathered a small bouquet, which I will put in the letter. I also send by Uncle Jimmy a tobacco bag and a watch guard made out of horsehair and a woolen hood knit with my own hands with love and best respects. We heard that you had captured a flag at Atlanta and was promoted for it to corporal. Is that some high office? I know you will be a general yet, because I always hear of your being in every battle and always the foremost man in the attack. Sam, please take care of yourself for my sake and don't let the Yankees kill you. Well, goodbye, darling. I will ever pray for God's richest and choicest blessings upon you. Be sure and write a long, long letter, I don't care how long, to your loving and sincere Jenny. The brave captain, when I got back to the Alabama River, opposite Montgomery, the ferryboat was on the other shore. A steamboat had just pulled out of its moorings and crossed over to where I was, and began to take on wood. I went on board, and told the captain, who was a clever and good man, that I would like to take a trip with him to Mobile and back, and that I was a wounded soldier from the hospital. He told me, all right, come along, and I will foot expenses. It was about sunset, but along the line of the distant horizon we could see the dark and heavy clouds begin to boil up in thick and ominous columns. The lightning was darting to and fro like lurid sheets of fire, and the storm seemed to be gathering. We could hear the storm king in his chariot in the clouds, rumbling as he came but a dead lull was seen and felt in the air and in nature. Everything was in a holy hush, except the hoarse belchings of the engines, the sizzing and frying of the boilers, and the work of the machinery on the lower deck. At last the storm burst upon us in all its fury. It was a tornado, and the women and children began to scream and pray the mate to curse and swear. I was standing by the captain on the main upper deck, as he was trying to direct the pilot how to steer the boat through that awful storm. When we heard the alarm bell ring out, and the hoarse cry of fire, 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 men were running toward the fire with buckets and the hose began throwing water on the flames. Men, women, and children were jumping in the water, and the captain used every effort to quiet the panic and to land his boat with its passengers, but the storm and fire were too much, and down the vessel sank to rise no more. Many had been saved in the lifeboat, and many were drowned. I jumped overboard, and the last thing I saw was the noble and brave captain still ringing the bell, as the vessel went down. He went down amid the flames to fill a watery grave. The water was full of struggling and dying people for miles. I did not go to Mobile. How I get back to Atlanta? 
when I got to Montgomery. The cars said toot, toot. And I raised the hue and cry and followed in pursuit. Kind friends, I fear that I have wearied you with my visit to Montgomery, but I am going back to camp now and will not leave it again until our banner is furled never to be again unfurled. I, you remember, was without a pass and did not wish to be carried a second time before that good, brave, and just provost marshal, and something told me not to go to the hospital. I found out when the cars would leave, and thought that I would get on them and go back without any trouble. I got on the cars, but was hustled off mighty quick, because I had no pass. A train of box cars was about leaving for West Point, and I took a seat on top of one of them, and was again hustled off. But I had determined to go, and as the engine began to puff and tug and pull, I slipped in between two box cars, sitting on one part of one and putting my feet on the other, and rode this way until I got to West Point. The conductor discovered me and had put me off several times before I got to West Point, but I would jump on again as soon as the cars started. When I got to West Point, a train of cars started off, and I ran, trying to get on, when Captain Peebles reached out his hand and pulled me in, and I arrived safe and sound at Atlanta. On my way back to Atlanta, I got with Dow Akin and Billy March. Billy March had been shot through the under jaw by a mini ball at the Octagon House, but by proper attention and nursing. He had recovered. Connor Akin was killed at the Octagon House and Dow wounded. When we got back to the regiment, then stationed near a fine concrete house where Shepard and I would sleep every night. Nearly right on our works, we found two 32 pound Parrot guns stationed in our immediate front and throwing shells away over our heads into the city of Atlanta. We had just begun to tell all the boys howdy when I saw Dow Kin fall. A fragment of shell had struck him on his backbone, and he was carried back wounded and bleeding. We could see the smoke boil up, and it would be nearly a minute before we would hear the report of the cannon. And then, a few moments after, we would hear the scream of the shell as it went on to Atlanta. We used to count from the time we would see the smoke boil up until we would hear the noise, and some fellow would call out. Look out, boys. The United States is sending iron over into the Southern Confederacy. Let's send a little league back to the United States and we would blaze away with our Enfield and Whitworth guns. And every time we would fire, we would silence those parrot guns. This kind of fun was carried on for 46 days. Death of Tom Tuck's rooster. Atlanta was a great place to fight chickens. I had heard much said about cockpits and cockfights but had never seen such a thing. Away over the hill, outside of the range of Thomas' thirty-pound parrot guns, with which he was trying to burn up Atlanta. The boys had fixed up a cockpit. It was fixed exactly like a circus ring, and seats and benches were arranged for the spectators. Well, I went to the cockfight one day, a great many roosters were to be pitted that day, and each one was trimmed and gaffed. A gaff is a long keen piece of steel, as sharp as a needle, 
that is fitted over the spurs. Well, I looked on at the fun. Tom Tuck's rooster was named Southern Confederacy, but this was abbreviated to Conft. And as a pet name, they called him Fed. Well, Fed was a trained rooster and would clean up a Bigfoot rooster as soon as he was put in the pit. But Tom always gave Fed every advantage. One day a green-looking country hunk came in with a rooster that he wanted to pit against Fed. He looked like a common rail splitter. The money was soon made up, and the stakes placed in proper hands. The gas were fitted. The roosters were placed in the pit and held until both were sufficiently mad to fight. When they were turned loose and each struck at the same time, I looked and poor Fed was dead. The other rooster had popped both gaffs through his head. He was a dead rooster, yea, a dead cock in the pit. Tom went and picked up his rooster and said, Poor Fed, I loved you. You used to crow every morning at daylight to wake me up. I have carried you a long time, but, alas, alas, poor Fed, your days are numbered, and those who fight will sometimes be slain. Now, friends, conscripts, countrymen, if you have any tears to shed, prepare to shed them now. I will not bury Fed. The evil that roosters do live after them, but the good is oft interred with their bones. So let it not be with Conft. Conft left no will, but I will pick him and fry him and dip my biscuit in his gravy. Poor fed Conft Confederacy, I place one hand on my heart and one on my head, regretting that I have not another to place on my stomach and whisper, softly whisper, in the most doleful accents, Goodbye, farewell, a long farewell. Not a laugh was heard, not even a joke, as the dead rooster in the camp kettle they hurried. For Tom had lost ten dollars and was broke, in the cockpit where Conf was buried. They cooked him slowly in the middle of the day, as the frying pan they were solemnly turning. The hungry fellows looking at him as he lay, with one side raw, the other burning. Some surplus feathers covered his breast, not in a shroud, but in a tiara they soused him. He lay like a picked chicken taking his rest, while the rebel boys danced and cursed around him. Not a few or short were the cuss words they said, yet they spoke many words of sorrow. As they steadfastly gazed on the face of the dead, and thought what will we do for chicken tomorrow? Likely they will talk of the southern conft, that's gone, and o'er his empty carcass upbraid him. But nothing he will wreck if they let him sleep on, in the place where they have laid him. Sadly and slowly they laid him down. From the field of fame fresh and gory, they ate off his flesh and threw away his bones, and then left them alone in their glory. When, cut, slash, bang, de-bang, and here comes a dash of Yankee cavalry right in the midst of the camp, under whip and spur, yelling like a band of wild Comanches, and bearing right down on the few mourners around the dead body of Conft. After making this bold dash, they about faced, and were soon out of sight. There was no harm done, but, alas, that cooked chicken was gone. Poor Conft! To what a sad end you have come, just to think that but a few short hours ago 
You was a proud rooster, was cock of the walk, and was considered invincible, but, alas, you have sunk so low as to become food for federals, requiescat in pace, you can crow no more. Old Joe Brown's Pets By way of grim jest, and a fitting burlesque to tragic scenes, or, rather, to the thing called glorious war. Old Joe Brown, then governor of Georgia, sent in his militia. It was the richest picture of an army I ever saw. It beat Four Paws' double ringed circus. Every one was dressed in citizens' clothes, and the very best they had at that time. A few had double barreled shotguns, but the majority had umbrellas and walking sticks, and nearly every one had on a duster. A flat bosom biled shirt and a plug hat, and to make the thing more ridiculous, the dwarf and the giant were marching side by side. The knock kneed by the side of the bow legged, the driven in by the side of the drawn out. The pale and sallow dyspeptic, who looked like Alex Stevens, and who seemed to have just been taken out of a chimney that smoked very badly, and whose diet was goobers and sweet potatoes, was placed beside the three hundred pounder who was dressed up to kill, and whose looks seemed to say, I've got a substitute in the army, and twenty negroes at home besides H.I.M. H.I.M. Now, that is the sort of army that old Joe Brown had when he seceded from the Southern Confederacy, declaring that each state was a separate sovereign government of itself, and, as old Joe Brown was an original secessionist, he wanted to exemplify the grand principles of secession that had been advocated by Patrick Henry, John Randolph of Roanoke, and John C. Calhoun, in all of whom he was a firm believer. I will say, however, in all due deference to the Georgia militia and old Joe Brown's pets, that there was many a gallant and noble fellow among them. I remember on one occasion that I was detailed to report to a captain of the 4th Tennessee Regiment, Colonel Farquharson. Called Guidepost, I have forgotten that captain's name. He was a small-sized man with a large, long set of black whiskers. He was the captain, and I the corporal of the detail. We were ordered to take a company of the Georgia militia on a scout. We went away around to our extreme right wing, passing through Terry's Mill Pond, and over the old battlefield of the 22nd, and past the place where General Walker fell when we came across two ladies. One of them kept going from one tree to another, and saying, This pine tree, that pine tree. This pine tree, that pine tree. In answer to our inquiry, they informed us that the young woman's husband was killed on the 22nd, and had been buried under a pine tree, and she was nearly crazy because she could not find his dead body. We passed on, and as soon as we came in sight of the old line of Yankee breastworks, an unexpected volley of mini balls was fired into our ranks, killing this captain of the 4th Tennessee Regiment and killing and wounding seven or eight of the Georgia militia. I hallowed to lay down as soon as possible, and a perfect whiz of mini balls passed over when I immediately gave the command of attention. Forward, charge and capture that squad, that Georgia militia, every man of them, charged forward, 
and in a few moments we ran into a small squad of Yankees and captured the whole layout. We then carried back to camp the dead captain and the killed and wounded militia. I had seen a great many men killed and wounded, but somehow or other these dead and wounded men of that day made a more serious impression on my mind than in any previous or subsequent battles. They were buried with all the honors of war, and I never will forget the incidents and scenes of this day as long as I live. We go after Stoneman. One morning our regiment was ordered to march, double quick, to the depot to take the cars for somewhere. The engine was under steam, and ready to start for that mysterious somewhere. The whistle blew long and loud, and away we went at breakneck speed for an hour, and drew up at a little place by the name of Jonesboro. The Yankees had captured the town, and were tearing up the railroad track. A regiment of rebel infantry and a brigade of cavalry were already in line of battle in their rear. We jumped out of the cars and advanced to attack them in front. Our line had just begun to open a pretty brisk fire on the Yankee cavalry when they broke, running right through and over the lines of the regiment of infantry and brigade of cavalry in their rear. The men opening ranks to get out of the way of the hoofs of their horses. It was Stoneman's cavalry, upon its celebrated raid toward Mackin and Andersonville to liberate the Federal prisoners. We went to work like beavers, and in a few hours the railroad track had been repaired so that we could pass. Every few miles we would find the track torn up, but we would get out of the cars, fix up the track, and light out again. We were charging a brigade of cavalry with a train of cars, as it were. They would try to stop our progress by tearing up the track, but we were crowding them a little too strong. At last they thought it was time to quit that foolishness, and then commenced a race between cavalry and cars for Mackin. Georgia the cars had to run exceedingly slow and careful, fearing a tear up or ambuscade, but at last Mackin came in sight. Twenty-five or thirty thousand Federal prisoners were confined at this place, and it was poorly guarded and protected. We feared that Stoneman would only march in, overpower the guards, and liberate the prisoners, and we would have some tall fighting to do. But on arriving at Mackin, we found that Stoneman and all of his command had just surrendered to a brigade of cavalry and the Georgia militia. And we helped march the gentlemen inside the prison walls at Mackin. They had furnished their own transportation, paying their own way and bearing their own expenses, and instead of liberating any prisoners, were themselves imprisoned. An extra detail was made as guard from our regiment to take them on to Andersonville. But I was not on this detail, so I remained until the detail returned. Mackin is a beautiful place. Business was flourishing like a green bay tree. The people were good, kind, and clever to us. Everywhere the hospitality of their homes was proffered us. We were regarded as their liberators. They gave us all the good things they had eating, drinking, etc. We felt our consequence. I assure you, reader, we felt we were heroes, indeed. But the benzene and other fluids became a little promiscuous, and the libations of the boys a little too heavy. 
They began to get boisterous, I might say, riotous. Some of the boys got to behaving badly and would go into stores and places and did many things they ought not to have done. In fact, the whole caboodle of them ought to have been carried to the guard house. They were whooping and yelling and firing off their guns just for the fun of the thing. I remember of going into a very nice family's house, and the old lady told the dog to go out, go out, sir, and remarked rather to herself, Go out, go out, I wish you were killed, anyhow, John says. Madam, do you want that dog killed? Sure enough, she says. Yes, I do. I do wish that he was dead. Before I could even think or catch my breath, bang went John's gun. And the dog was weltering in his blood right on the good lady's floor, the top of his head entirely torn off. I confess, reader, that I came very near jumping out of my skin, as it were, at the unexpected discharge of the gun. And other such scenes, I reckon, were being enacted elsewhere, but at last a detail was sent around to arrest all stragglers. And we were soon rolling back to Atlanta, Bellum, Lethale. Well, after jugging Stoneman, we go back to Atlanta and occupy our same old place near the concrete house. We found everything exactly as we had left it, with the exception of the increased number of graybacks, which seemed to have propagated a thousandfold since we left, and they were crawling about like ants, making little paths and tracks in the dirt as they wiggled and waddled about, hunting for ye old rebel soldier. Sherman's two thirty-pound parrot guns were in the same position, and every now and then a lazy-looking shell would pass over, speeding its way on to Atlanta. The old citizens had dug little cellars, which the soldiers called gopher holes, and the women and children were crowded together in these cellars, while Sherman was trying to burn the city over their heads. But, as I am not writing history, I refer you to any history of the war for Sherman's war record in and around Atlanta. As John and I started to go back, we thought we would visit the hospital. Great God, I get sick today when I think of the agony and suffering and sickening stench and odor of dead and dying of wounds and sloughing sores caused by the deadly gangrene, of the groaning and wailing. I cannot describe it. I remember I went in the rear of the building, and there I saw a pile of arms and legs rotting and decomposing, and, although I saw thousands of horrifying scenes during the war, yet today I have no recollection in my whole life of ever seeing anything that I remember with more horror than that pile of legs and arms that had been cut off our soldiers. As John and I went through the hospital, and were looking at the poor suffering fellows, I heard a weak voice calling, Sam, oh, Sam, I went to the poor fellow, but did not recognize him at first but soon found out that it was James Galbraith. The poor fellow who had been shot nearly in two on the 22nd of July. I tried to be cheerful and said, Hello, Galbraith, old fellow. I thought you were in heaven long before this. He laughed a sort of dry, cracking laugh and asked me to hand him a drink of water. I handed it to him. He then began to mumble and tell me something in a rambling and incoherent way, 
but all I could catch was for me to write to his family, who were living near in Teague Pleasant. I asked him if he was badly wounded. He only pulled down the blanket. That was all. I get sick when I think of it. The lower part of his body was hanging to the upper part by a shred, and all of his entrails were lying on the cot with him. The bile and other excrements exuding from them, and they full of maggots. I replaced the blanket as tenderly as I could, and then said, Galbraith, goodbye. I then kissed him on his lips and forehead and left. As I passed on, he kept trying to tell me something, but I could not make out what he said, and fearing I would cause him to exert himself too much. I left. It was the only field hospital that I saw during the whole war, and I have no desire to see another. Those hollow-eyed and sunken-cheeked sufferers shot in every conceivable part of the body. Some shrieking and calling upon their mothers, some laughing the hard, cackling laugh of the sufferer without hope. And some cursing like troopers, and some writhing and groaning as their wounds were being bandaged and dressed. I saw a man of the twenty-seventh, who had lost his right hand, another his leg, then another whose head was laid open. And I could see his brain thump, and another with his under jaw shot off, in fact, wounded in every manner possible. Ah, reader, there is no glory for the private soldier, much less a conscript. James Galbraith was a conscript as was also Fane King. Mr. King was killed at Chickamauga. He and Galbraith were conscripted and joined Company H at the same time. Both were old men and very poor, with large families at home, and they were forced to go to war against their wishes. While their wives and little children were at home without the necessaries of life, the officers have all the glory. Glory is not for the private soldier, such as die in the hospitals, being eat up with the deadly gangrene, and being imperfectly waited on. Glory is for generals, colonels, majors, captains, and lieutenants. They have all the glory, and when the poor private wins battles by dint of sweat, hard marches, camp and picket duty. Fasting and broken bones, the officers get the glory. The private's pay was $11 per month if he got it. The general's pay was $300 per month. And he always got his. I am not complaining. These things happened 16 to 20 years ago. Men who never fired a gun, nor killed a Yankee during the whole war, are today the heroes of the war. Now, I tell you what I think about it. I think that those of us who fought as private soldiers, fought as much for glory as the general did. And those of us who stuck it out to the last, deserve more praise than the general who resigned because some other general was placed in command over him. A general could resign. That was honorable. A private could not resign, nor choose his branch of service. And if he deserted, it was death. The scout and death of a Yankee lieutenant. General Hood had sent off all his cavalry and a detail was made each day of so many men for a scout, to find out all we could about the movements of the Yankees. Colonel George Porter, of the 6th Tennessee, was in command of the detail. We passed through Atlanta, 
and went down the railroad for several miles, and then made a flank movement toward where we expected to come in contact with the Yankees. When we came to a skirt of woods, we were deployed as skirmishers. Colonel Porter ordered us to reprime our guns and to advance at twenty-five paces apart, being deployed as skirmishers, and to keep under cover as much as possible. He need not have told us this, because we had not learned war for nothing. We would run from one tree to another, and then make a careful reconnoiter before proceeding to another. We had begun to get a little careless when bang, 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 it seemed that we had got into a Yankee ambush. The firing seemed to be from all sides, and was rattling among the leaves and bushes. It appeared as if some supernatural, infernal battle was going on and the air was full of smoke. We had not seen the Yankees. I ran to a tree to my right, and just as I got to it, I saw my comrade sink to the ground. Clutching at the air as he fell dead, I kept trying to see the Yankees, so that I might shoot. I had been looking a hundred yards ahead, when happening to look not more than ten paces from me, I saw a big six-foot Yankee with a black feather in his hat. Aiming deliberately at me, I dropped to the ground, and at the same moment heard the report, and my hat was knocked off in the bushes. I remained perfectly still, and in a few minutes I saw a young Yankee lieutenant peering through the bushes. I would rather not have killed him, but I was afraid to fire and afraid to run, and yet I did not wish to kill him. He was as pretty as a woman, and somehow I thought I had met him before. Our eyes met. He stood like a statue. He gazed at me with a kind of scared expression. I still did not want to kill him, and am sorry today that I did, for I believe I could have captured him. But I fired and saw the blood spurt all over his face. He was the prettiest youth I ever saw. When I fired, the Yankees broke and run and I went up to the boy I had killed. And the blood was gushing out of his mouth. I was sorry. Atlanta forsaken. One morning about the break of day our artillery opened along our breastworks, scaring us almost to death. For it was the first guns that had been fired for more than a month. We sprang to our feet and grabbed our muskets, and ran out and asked someone what did that mean. We were informed that they were feeling for the Yankees. The comment that was made by the private soldier was simply two words, and those two words were, oh, shucks. The Yankees had gone no one knew whither, and our batteries were shelling the woods, feeling for them. Oh, shucks. Hello, says Hood. War in the Dickens and Tom Walker are them Yanks. Hey, feel for them with long-range feelers. A boom, boom. Can anybody tell me war them Yanks are? Send out a few more feelers. The feelers in the shape of cannonballs will bring them to talk. Boom, boom, boom. For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the general was lost. For the want of a general, the battle was lost. Forrest's cavalry had been sent off somewhere. Wheeler's cavalry had been sent away yonder in the rear of the enemy to tear up the railroad and cut off their supplies, etc. 
and we had to find out the movements of the enemy by feeling for them, by shelling the vacant woods. The Yankees were at that time 25 miles in our rear, a hundred thousand strong, at a place called Jonesboro. I do not know how it was found out that they were at Jonesboro, but anyhow, the news had come and Cheatham's corps had to go and see about it. Stewart's corps must hold Atlanta, and Stephen D. Lee's corps must be stretched at proper distance, so that the word could be passed backward and forward as to how they were getting along. As yet it is impossible to tell of the movements of the enemy, because our cannonballs had not come back and reported any movements to us. We had always heard that cannonballs were blind, and we did not suppose they could see to find their way back. Well, our corps made a forced march for a day and a night, and passed the word back that we had seen some signs of the Yankees being in that vicinity, and thought perhaps a small portion, about a hundred thousand, were nigh about there somewhere. Says he, it's a strange thing you don't know, send out your feelers. We sent out a few feelers, and they report back very promptly that the Yankees are here sure enough, or that is what our feelers say. Pass the word up the line. The word is passed from mouth to mouth of Lee's skirmish line 25 miles back to Atlanta. Well, if that be the case, we will set fire to all of our army stores, spike all our cannon, and play smash generally, and forsake Atlanta. In the meantime, just hold on where you are till Stuart gets through his job of blowing up arsenals, burning up the army stores, and spiking the cannon and we will send our negro boy Caesar down to the horse lot to see if he can't catch old Nance. But she is such a fool with that young suckling colt of hers that it takes him almost all day to catch her. And if the drawbars happen to be down, she will get in the clover patch, and I don't think he will catch her today. But if he don't catch her, I will ride Balaam anyhow. He's got a mighty sore back, and needs a shoe put on his left hind foot, and he cut his ankle with a broken shoe on his forefoot, and has not been fed today, however. I will be along by and by. Stuart, do you think you will be able to get through with your job of blowing up by day after tomorrow? Or by Saturday at twelve o'clock, Lee pass the word down to Cheatham, and ask him what he thinks the Yankees are doing. Now, Kinlock, get my duster and umbrella, and bring out Balaam. Now, reader, that was the impression made on the private's mind at that time. Chapter Roman 14, Jonesboro the Battle of Jonesboro, Stuart's corps was at Atlanta. Lee's corps was between Atlanta and Jonesboro. And Cheatham's corps, then numbering not more than 5,000 men because the woods and roads were full of straggling soldiers, who were not in the fight was face to face with the whole Yankee army, and he was compelled to flee fight or surrender. This was the position and condition of the Grand Army of Tennessee on this memorable occasion. If I am not mistaken, General Cleburne was commanding Cheatham's corps at that time. We expected to be ordered into action every moment, and kept seesawing backward and forward, until I did not know which way the Yankees were or which way the rebels, we would form line of battle, charge bayonets, and would raise a whoop and yell. 
expecting to be dashed right against the Yankee lines, and then the order would be given to retreat. Then we would immediately reform and be ordered to charge again a mile off at another place. Then we would march and counter march backward and forward over the same ground, passing through Jonesboro away over the hill, and then back through the town, first four forward and back, your right hand to your left hand lady, swing half round and balance all. This sort of a movement is called a feint. A feint is what is called in poker a bluff, or what is called in a bully a brag. A feint means anything but a fight. If a lady faints, she is either scared or in love and wants to fall in her lover's arms. If an army makes a faint movement, it is trying to hide some other movement. Hello, Lee, what does Cleburne say the Yankees are doing at Jonesboro? They are fanning themselves. Well, keep up that faint movement until all the boys faint from sheer exhaustion. Hello, Stuart, do you think you will be able to burn up those ten locomotives and destroy those hundred carloads of provisions by day after tomorrow? Lee asked Cleburne if he feels fainty. Ask him how a fellow feels when he faints. Cleburne says, I have fainted, fainted and fainted, until I can't faint any longer. Well, says Hood, if you can't faint any longer, you had better flee, fight, or faint. Balaam gets along mighty slow, but I will be far after a while. At one o'clock we were ordered to the attack. We had to pass through an osage orange hedge that was worse than the enemy's fire. Their breastworks were before us, we yelled and charged and hurrahed, and said, Boo, boo, we are coming. Coming, look out, don't you see us coming? Why don't you let us hear the cannon's opening roar? Why don't you rattle a few old muskets over there at us? Boo, boo, we are coming. Tag, we have done got to your breastworks. Now... We tagged first, why don't you tag back? A Yankee seems to be lying on the other side of the breastworks sunning himself. And raising himself on his elbow, says, Fool, who with your fatty bread, W-E-R-2-O-L-D, a bird's to be caught with that kind of chaff. We don't want any of that kind of pie. What you got there wouldn't make a mouthful. Bring on your pudding and pound cake, and then we will talk to ye. General Granberry, who, poor fellow, was killed in the butchery at Franklin afterwards, goes up to the breastworks and says, Look here, Yank, we are fighting, sure enough. Main here Dutchman comes out and says, Ich dot so well. I ish keen von little pit hungry dish morning. And I just gobble you up for main lunch pefor tinner dime. Dot ish der kind of man's vat I bees. Now, reader, that is a fine description of this memorable battle. That's it no more, no less. I was in it all, and saw General Granberry captured. We did our level best to get up a fight, but it was no go, any way we could fix it up. I mean no disrespect to General Hood. He was a noble, brave, and good man, and we loved him for his many virtues and goodness of heart. I do not propose to criticize his generalship or ability as a commander. I only write of the impression and sentiment that were made upon the private's mind at the time, and as I remember them now. 
but Atlanta had fallen into the hands of the Yankees, and they were satisfied for the time. Death of Lieutenant John Whittaker At this place we built small breastworks, but for what purpose I never knew. The Yankees seemed determined not to fight. No way we could fix it. Every now and then, they would send over a feeler to see how we were getting along. Sometimes these feelers would do some damage. I remember one morning we were away over a hill, and every now and then here would come one of those lazy-looking feelers. Just bouncing along as if he were in no hurry, called in military ricochet. They were very easy to dodge, if you could see them in time. Well, one morning, as before remarked, Lieutenant John Whittaker, then in command of Company H and myself, were sitting down eating breakfast out of the same tin plate. We were sopping gravy out with some cold cornbread when Captain W. C. Flournoy of the Martin Guards hallowed out, look out, Sam, look, look, I just turned my head, and in turning, the cannonball knocked my hat off, and striking Lieutenant Whittaker full in the side of the head, carried away the whole of the skull part, leaving only the face. His brains fell in the plate from which we were sopping, and his head fell in my lap, deluging my face and clothes with his blood. Poor fellow, he never knew what hurt him. His spirit went to its god that morning. Green Reeves carried the poor boy off on his shoulder, and, after wrapping him up in a blanket, buried him. His bones are at Jonesboro today. The cannonball did not go twenty yards after accomplishing its work of death. Captain Flournoy laughed at me and said, Sam, that came very near getting you. One tenth of an inch more would have cooked you a goose. I saw another man try to stop one of those balls that was just rolling along on the ground. He put his foot out to stop the ball, but the ball did not stop. He no doubt today walks on a cork leg and is tax collector of the county in which he lives. I saw a thoughtless boy trying to catch one in his hands as it bounced along. He caught it, but the next moment his spirit had gone to meet its god. But, poor John, we all loved him. He died for his country. His soul is with his god. He gave his all for the country he loved and may he rest in peace under the shade of the tree where he is buried. And may the birds sing their sweetest songs, the flowers put forth their most beautiful blooms, while the gentle breezes play about the brave boy's grave. Green Reeves was the only person at the funeral. No tears of a loving mother or gentle sister were there. Green interred his body, and there it will remain till the resurrection. John Whittaker deserves more than a passing notice. He was noble and brave, and when he was killed, Company H was without an officer then commanding. Every single officer had been killed, wounded, or captured. John served as a private soldier the first year of the war and at the reorganization at Corinth, Mississippi. He, W. J. Whitthorne, and myself all ran for orderly sergeant of Company H, and John was elected, and the first vacancy occurring after the death of Captain Webster. He was commissioned brevet second lieutenant. When the war broke out, John was clerking for John L., T.S. Brandon in Columbia. 
He had been in every march, skirmish, and battle that had been fought during the war. Along the dusty road, on the march, in the bivouac, and on the battlefield, he was the same noble, generous boy. Always kind, ever gentle, a smile ever lighting up his countenance. He was one of the most even-tempered men I ever knew. Never knew him to speak an unkind word to anyone or use a profane or vulgar word in my life. One of those ricochet cannon balls struck my old friend, N. The Shepherd. Shep was one of the bravest and best soldiers who ever shouldered a musket. It is true, he was but a private soldier, but he was the best friend I had during the whole war. In intellect, he was far ahead of most of the generals, and would have honored and adorned the name of general in the sea. S.A. He was ever brave and true. He followed our cause to the end, yet all the time an invalid. Today he is languishing on a bed of pain and sickness, caused by that ball at Jonesboro. The ball struck him on his knapsack, knocking him twenty feet, and breaking one or two ribs and dislocating his shoulder. He was one of God's noble men, indeed none braver, none more generous. God alone controls our destinies, and surely he who watched over us and took care of us in those dark and bloody days will not forsake us now. God alone fits and prepares for us the things that are in store for us. There is none so wise as to foresee the future or foretell the end. God sometimes seems afar off but he will never leave or forsake anyone who puts his trust in him. The day will come when the good as well as evil will all meet on one broad platform, to be rewarded for the deeds done in the body. When time shall end, with the gates of eternity closed, and the key fastened to the girdle of God forever. Pardon me, reader, I have wandered. But when my mind reverts to those scenes and times, I seem to live in another age and time, and I sometimes think that after us comes the end of the universe. I am not trying to moralize. I am only trying to write a few scenes and incidents that came under the observation of a poor old rebel webfoot private soldier in those stormy days and times. Histories tell the great facts, while I only tell of the minor incidents. But, on this day of which I now write, we can see in plain view more than a thousand Yankee battle flags waving on top the red earthworks. Not more than four hundred yards off. Every private soldier there knew that General Hood's army was scattered all the way from Jonesboro to Atlanta. A distance of twenty-five miles without any order, discipline, or spirit to do anything. We could hear General Stuart, away back yonder in Atlanta, still blowing up arsenals and smashing things generally while Stephen D. Lee was somewhere between Lovejoy Station and Mackin, scattering. And here was but a demoralized remnant of Cheatham's corps facing the whole Yankee army. I have ever thought that Sherman was a poor general not to have captured Hood and his whole army at that time. But it matters not what I thought as I am not trying to tell the ifs and ands, but only of what I saw. In a word, we had everything against us. The soldiers distrusted everything. 
They were broken down with their long days, hard marching, were almost dead with hunger and fatigue. Every one was taking his own course and wishing and praying to be captured. Hard and senseless marching, with little sleep, half rations and lice, had made their lives a misery. Each one prayed that all this foolishness might end one way or the other. It was too much for human endurance. Every private soldier knew that such things as this could not last. They were willing to ring down the curtain, put out the footlights and go home. There was no hope in the future for them. Then comes the farce. From this time forward, until the close of the war, everything was a farce as to generalship. The tragedy had been played, the glory of war had departed. We all loved Hood. He was such a clever fellow, and a good man. Well, Yank, why don't you come on and take us? We are ready to play quits now. We have not anything to let you have, you know, but you can parole us, you know, and we will go home and be good boys. You know, good union boys, you know, and we will be sorry for the war, you know, and we wouldn't have the Negroes in any way. Shape, form, or fashion, you know, and the American continent has no north, no south, no east, no west, boo-hoo. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo, tut, tut, Johnny, all that sounds tolerable nice, but then you might want some favor from Uncle Sam. And the teat is too full of milk at the present time for us to turn loose. It's a sugar teat, Johnny, and just begins to taste sweet. And, besides, Johnny, once or twice you have put us to a little trouble. We haven't forgot that, and we've got you down now our foot is on your neck, and you must feel our boot heel. We want to stamp you a little, that's what's the matter with Hannah. And, Johnny, you fought us hard. You are a brave boy. You are proud and aristocratic, Johnny, and we are going to crush your cursed pride and spirit. And now, Johnny, come here, I've something to whisper in your ear. Hold your ear close down here, so that no one can hear. We want big fat offices when the war is over. Some of us want to be presidents, some governors, some go to Congress, and be big ministers to Europe, and all those kind of things. Johnny, you number just go back to your camp. Johnny, chase round. Put on a bold front, flourish your trumpets. Blow your horns. And, Johnny, we don't want to be hard on you and we will tell you what we will do for you. Away back in your territory, between Columbia and Nashville, is the most beautiful country and the most fertile. And we have lots of rations up there, too. Now, you just go up there, Johnny, and stay until we want you. We ain't done with you yet, my boy O. Oh. No, Johnny, and another thing, Johnny, you will find there between M.T. Pleasant and Columbia, the most beautiful country that the sun of heaven ever shone upon. And halfway between the two places is St. John's Church. Its tower is all covered over with a beautiful vine of ivy, and, Johnny, you know that in olden times it was the custom to entwine a wreath of ivy around the brows of victorious generals. We have no doubt that many of your brave generals will express a wish, when they pass by, to be buried beneath the ivy vine, 
that shades so gracefully and beautifully the wall of this grand old church. And, Johnny, you will find a land of beauty and plenty, and when you get there, just put on as much style as you like. Just pretend, for our sake you know, that you are a bully boy with a glass eye, and that you are the victorious army that has returned to free and oppressed people. We will allow you this, Johnny, so that we will be the greater when we want you, Johnny. And now, Johnny, we did not want to tell you what we are going to say to you now, but will, so that you will feel bad. Sherman wants to march to the sea, while the world looks on and wonders. He wants to desolate the land and burn up your towns, to show what a coward he is, and how dastardly, and one of our boys wants to write a piece of poetry about it. But that ain't all, Johnny. You know that you fellows have got a great deal of cotton at Augusta, Savannah. Charleston, Mobile, and other places, and cotton is worth two dollars a pound in gold, and as Christmas is coming, we want to go down there for some of that cotton to make a Christmas gift to old Abe and old Chloe, don't you see, oh? No, Johnny, we don't want to end the war just yet a while. The sugar is mighty sweet in the teat, and we want to suck a while longer. Why, sir, we want to rob and then burn every house in Georgia and South Carolina. We will get millions of dollars by robbery alone, don't you see? Palmetto, hark from the tomb, that doleful sound, my ears attend the cry. General J.B. Hood established his headquarters at Palmetto, Georgia, and here is where we were visited by his honor. The Honorable Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America, and the Right Honorable Robert Toombs, Secretary of State under the said Davis, now, kind reader, don't ask me to write history. I know nothing of history. See the histories for grand movements and military maneuvers. I can only tell of what I saw and how I felt. I can remember now General Robert Toombs and Han. Jeff Davis Speeches I remember how funny Toombs' speech was. He kept us all laughing by telling us how quick we were going to whip the Yankees, and how they would skedaddle back across the Ohio River like a dog with a tin oyster can tied to his tail. Captain Joe P. Lee and I laughed until our sides hurt us. I can remember today how I felt. I felt that Davis and Toombs had come there to bring us glad tidings of great joy and to proclaim to us that the ratification of a treaty of peace had been declared between the Confederate States of America and the United States. I remember how good and happy I felt when these two leading statesmen told of when grim-visaged war would smooth her wrinkled front, and when the dark clouds that had so long lowered o'er our own loved South would be in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. I do not know how others felt, but I can say never before or since did I feel so grand. I came very near saying gloomy and peculiar. I felt that I and every other soldier who had stood the storms of battle for nearly four long years were now about to be discharged from hard marches and scant rations and ragged clothes and standing guard etc. In fact, the black cloud of war had indeed drifted away, 
and the beautiful stars that gemmed the blue ether above. Smiling, said, peace, peace, peace. I felt bully, I tell you. I remember what I thought that the emblem of our cause was the palmetto and the Texas star and the town of palmetto were symbolical of our ultimate triumph, and that we had unconsciously, nay, I should say, prophetically, fallen upon Palmetto as the most appropriate place to declare peace between the two sections. I was sure Jeff Davis and Bob Toombs had come there for the purpose of receiving the capitulation of and to make terms with our conquered foes. I knew that in every battle we had fought, except Missionary Ridge, we had whipped the Yankees, and I knew that we had no cavalry, and but little artillery, and only two corps of infantry at Missionary Ridge, and from the way Jeff and Bob talked. It was enough to make us old private soldiers feel that swelling of the heart we near should feel again, I remember that other high dignitaries and big bugs, then the controlling spirits of the government at Richmond, visited us and most all of these high dignitaries shook hands with the boys. It was all hands round, swing the corner, and balance your partner. I shook hands with Honorable Jeff Davis, and he said, Howdy, Captain. I shook hands with Toombs, and he said, Howdy, Major, and every big bug, that I shook hands with put another star on my collar and chicken guts on my sleeve. My pen is inadequate to describe the ecstasy and patriotic feeling that permeated every vein and fiber of my animated being. It was paradise regained. All the long struggles we had followed the palmetto flag through victory and defeat. Through storms and rains, and snows and tempest, along the dusty roads, and on the weary marches, we had been true to our country, our cause and our people, and there was a conscious pride within us that when we would return to our homes, we would go back as conquerors, and that we would receive the plaudits of our people well done, good and faithful servants. You have been true and faithful even to the end. Jeff Davis makes a speech. Sinner, come view the ground where you shall shortly lie. I remember that Honorable Jeff Davis visited the army at this place, and our regiment, the 1st Tennessee, serenaded him. After playing several airs, he came out of General Hood's marquee and spoke substantially as follows. As near as I can remember, soldiers of the 1st Tennessee Regiment, I should have said captains, for every man among you is fit to be a captain. I have heard of your acts of bravery on every battlefield during the whole war and captains, so far as my wishes are concerned. I today make every man of you a captain, and I say honestly today, were I a private soldier, I would have no higher ambition on earth than to belong to the 1st Tennessee Regiment. You have been loyal and brave. Your ranks have never yet, in the whole history of the war, been broken. Even though the army was routed, yet, my brave soldiers, Tennesseans all, you have ever remained in your places in the ranks of the regiment, ever subject to the command of your gallant Colonel Field in every battle, march, skirmish, in an advance or a retreat. There are on the books of the War Department at Richmond the names of a quarter of a million deserters. Yet, you, my brave soldiers, captains all, have remained true and steadfast. 
I have heard that some have been dissatisfied with the removal of General Joe E. Johnston and the appointment of General Hood, but, my brave and gallant heroes, I say, I have done what I thought best for your good. Soon we commence our march to Kentucky and Tennessee. Be of good cheer, for within a short while your faces will be turned homeward, and your feet will press Tennessee soil, and you will tread your native heath amid the blue grass regions and pastures green of your native homes. We will flank General Sherman out of Atlanta, tear up the railroad and cut off his supplies, and make Atlanta a perfect Moscow of defeat to the Federal Army. Situated as he is in an enemy's country, with his communications all cut off, and our army in the rear, he will be powerless, and being fully posted and cognizant of our position, and of the Federal Army, this movement will be the ultima fuel, the grand crowning stroke for our independence, and the conclusion of the war. Armistice in name only. About this time, the Yankees sent us a flag of truce, asking an armistice to move every citizen of Atlanta south of their lines. It was granted. They wanted to live in fine houses a while, and then rob and burn them, and issued orders for all the citizens of Atlanta to immediately abandon the city. They wanted Atlanta for themselves, you see. For weeks and months the roads were filled with loaded wagons of old and decrepit people who had been hunted and hounded from their homes with a relentless cruelty worse, yea, much worse, than ever blackened the pages of barbaric or savage history. I remember assisting in unloading our wagons that General Hood, poor fellow, had kindly sent in to bring out the citizens of Atlanta to a little place called Rough and Ready about halfway between Palmetto and Atlanta. Every day I would look on at the suffering of delicate ladies, old men, and mothers with little children clinging to them, crying, Oh, mamma, mamma, and old women, and tottering old men, whose gray hairs should have protected them from the savage acts of Yankee hate and Puritan barbarity. And I wondered how on earth our generals, including those who had resigned, that is where the shoe pinches could quietly look on at this dark, black and damning insult to our people, and not use at least one effort to rescue them from such terrible and unmitigated cruelty barbarity, and outrage. General Hood remonstrated with Sherman against the insult, stating that it transcended in studied and ingenious cruelty. All acts ever before brought to my attention in the dark history of war. In the great crisis of the war, Hardy, Kirby Smith, Breckinridge, and many brigadiers resigned, thus throwing all the responsibility upon poor Hood. I desire to state that they left the army on account of rank. Oh, this thing of rank! Many other generals resigned, and left us privates in the lurch. But the gallant chief M. Cleburne, Granberry, Gist, Strahl, Adams, John C., Brown, William B. Bate, Stewart, Lowry, and others stuck to us to the last. The sinews of war were strained to their utmost tension. A scout. At this place I was detailed as a regular scout, which position I continued to hold during our stay at Palmetto. It was a good thing. It beat camp guard all hollow. I had answered here at roll call ten thousand times in these nearly four years. 
but I had sorter of got used to the darn thing. Now, reader, I will give you a few chapters on the kind of fun I had for a while. Our instructions were simply to try and find out all we could about the Yankees and report all movements. One dark, rainy evening, while out as a scout, and after traveling all day, I was returning from the Yankee outposts at Atlanta and had captured a Yankee prisoner, who I then had under my charge, and whom I afterwards carried and delivered to General Hood. He was a considerable muggins, and a great coward, in fact, a Yankee deserter. I soon found out that there was no harm in him, as he was tired of war anyhow, and was anxious to go to prison. We went into an old log cabin near the road until the rain would be over. I was standing in the cabin door looking at the raindrops fall off the house and make little bubbles in the drip, and listening to the pattering on the clapboard roof, when happening to look up, not fifty yards off, I discovered a regiment of Yankee cavalry approaching. I knew it would be utterly impossible for me to get away unseen, and I did not know what to do. The Yankee prisoner was scared almost to death, I said. Look, look, I turned in the room and found the planks of the floor were loose. I raised two of them and yanked and I slipped through. I replaced the planks and could peep out beneath the sill of the house and see the legs of the horses. They passed on and did not come to the old house. They were at least a half hour in passing. At last the main regiment had all passed and I saw the rear guard about to pass when I heard the captain say, Go and look in that old house. Three fellows detached themselves from the command and came dashing up to the old house. I thought gone up shore, as I was afraid the Yankee prisoner would make his presence known. When the three men came up, they pushed open the door and looked around, and one fellow said boo. They then rode off. But that boo, I was sure I was caught but I was not. What is this rebel doing here? I would go up to the Yankee outpost, and if some popinjay of a tacky officer didn't come along, we would have a good time. One morning I was sitting down to eat a good breakfast with the Yankee outpost. They were cavalry, and they were mighty clever and pleasant fellows. I looked down the road toward Atlanta, and not fifty yards from the outpost, I saw a body of infantry approaching. I don't know why I didn't run. I ought to have done so, but didn't. I stayed there until this body of infantry came up. They had come to relieve the cavalry. It was a detail of Negro soldiers, headed by the meanest-looking white man as their captain, I ever saw. In very abrupt words, he told the cavalry that he had come to take their place, and they were ordered to report back to their command. Happening to catch sight of me, he asked, What is this rebel doing here? One of the men spoke up and tried to say something in my favor. But... The more he said, the more the captain of the blacks would get mad. He started toward me two or three times. He was starting, I could see by the flush of his face, to take hold of me. Anyhow, the cavalrymen tried to protest, and said a few cuss words. The captain of the blacks looks back very mad at the cavalry. 
Here was my opportunity, now or never, Uncle Negro looked on, not seeming to care for the cavalry, Captain. Or for me, I took up my gun very gently and cocked it. I had the gentleman. I had made up my mind, if he advanced one step further, that he was a dead man. When he turned to look again, it was a look of surprise. His face was as red as a scalded beet, but in a moment was as white as a sheet. He was afraid to turn his head to give a command. The cavalry motioned their hands at me, as much as to say, Run, Johnny, run. The captain of the blacks fell upon his face, and I broke and ran like a quarter horse. I never saw or heard any more of the captain of the blacks or his guard afterward. Look out, boys. One night, five of us scouts, I thought all strangers to me, put up at an old gentleman's house. I took him for a Catholic priest. His head was shaved, and he had on a loose gown like a lady's dress, and a large cord and tassel tied around his waist, from which dangled a large bunch of keys. He treated us very kindly and hospitably, so far as words and politeness went. But we had to eat our own rations and sleep on our own blankets. At bedtime, he invited us to sleep in a shed in front of his double log cabin. We all went in, laid down, and slept. A little while before day, the old priest came in and woke us up, and said he thought he saw in the moonlight a detachment of cavalry coming down the road from toward the rebel lines. One of our party jumped up and said there was a company of cavalry coming that way, and then all four broke toward the old priest's room. I jumped up, put on one boot, and holding the other in my hand, I stepped out in the yard, with my hat and coat off both being left in the room. A Yankee captain stepped up to me and said, Are you no? Two hundred. I answered very huskily, No, sir, I am not. He then went on in the house, and on looking at the fence, I saw there was at least two hundred Yankee cavalry right at me. I did not know what to do. My hat, coat, gun, cartridge box, and knapsack were all in the room. I was afraid to stay there and I was afraid to give the alarm. I soon saw almost every one of the Yankees dismount, and then I determined to give the alarm and run. I hallowed out as loud as I could, look out, boys, and broke and run. I had to jump over a garden picket fence, and as I lit on the other side, bang, 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 was fired right after me. They stayed there but a short time, and I went back and got my gun and other accoutrements. Am captured. When I left the old priest's house, it was then good day nearly sun up, and I had started back toward our lines, and had walked on about half a mile, not thinking of danger when four Yankees jumped out in the middle of the road and said, Halt, there, oh, yes, we've got you at last. I wasn't for it. What could I do? Their guns were cocked and leveled at me, and if I started to run, I would be shot, so I surrendered. In a very short time the regiment of Yankee cavalry came up, and the first greeting I had was, Hello, you ain't no. Two hundred are you, I was taken prisoner. They, I thought, seemed to be very gleeful about it, 
and I had to march right back by the old priest's house. And they carried me to the headquarters of General Stephen Williams. As soon as he saw me, he said, Who have you there, a prisoner or a deserter? They said, A prisoner. From what command? No one answered. Finally he asked me what command I belonged to. I told him the Confederate States Army. Then, said he, what is your name? Said I, General, if that would be any information. I would have no hesitancy in giving it, but I claim your protection as a prisoner of war. I am a private soldier in the Confederate States Army, and I don't feel authorized to answer any question you may ask. He looked at me with a kind of quizzical look, and said, That is the way with you rebels. I have never yet seen one of you, but thought what little information he might possess to be of value to the Union forces. Then, one of the men spoke up and said, I think he is a spy or a scout, and does not belong to the regular army. He then gave me a close look and said, Ah, ah, a guerrilla, and ordered me to be taken to the provost marshal's office. They carried me to a large, fine house, upstairs, and I was politely requested to take a seat. I sat there some moments, when a dandy-looking clerk of a fellow came up with a book in his hand, and said, The name. I appeared not to understand, and he said, The name. I still looked at him, and he said, The name. I did not know what he meant by the name. Finally, he closed the book with a slam and started off, and said I, Did you want to find out my name? He said, I asked you three times. I said, When, if you ever asked me my name, I have never heard it. But he was too mad to listen to anything else. I was carried to another room in the same building and locked up. I remained there until about dark, when a man brought me a tolerably good supper, and then left me alone to my own meditations. I could hear the sentinels at all times of the night calling out the hours. I did not sleep a wink, nor even lay down. I had made up my mind to escape, if there was any possible chance. About three o'clock everything got perfectly still. I went to the window, and it had a heavy bolt across it, and I could not open it. I thought I would try the door, but I knew that a guard was stationed in the hall, for I could see a dim light glimmer through the keyhole. I took my knife and unscrewed the catch in which the lock was fastened, and soon found out that I could open the door. But then there was the guard, standing at the main entrance downstairs. I peeped down, and he was quietly walking to and fro on his beat, every time looking to the hall. I made up my mind by his measured tread as to how often he would pass the door, and one time, after he had just passed, I came out in the hall and started to run down the steps. About midway down the steps, one of them cracked very loud, but I ran on down in the lower hall and ran into a room, the door of which was open. The sentinel came back to the entrance of the hall and listened a few minutes and then moved on again. I went to the window and raised the sash, but the blind was fastened with a kind of patent catch. I gave one or two hard pushes and felt it move. After that I made one big lunge 
and it flew wide open. But it made a noise that woke up every sentinel. I jumped out in the yard and gained the street, and on looking back, I heard the alarm given, and lights began to glimmer everywhere, but seeing no one directly after me, I made tracks toward Peachtree Creek and went on until I came to the old battlefield of July 22nd and made my way back to our lines. Chapter Roman 15 Advance into Tennessee General Hood makes a flank movement. After remaining a good long time at Jonesboro, the news came that we were going to flank Atlanta. We flanked it. A flank means a go around. Yank says, What you doing, Johnny? Johnny says, We are flanking. Yank says, Bully for you. We passed around Atlanta, crossed the Chattahoochee, and traveled back over the same route on which we had made the arduous campaign under Joe Johnston. It took us four months in the first instance, and but little longer than as many days in the second, to get back to Dalton. Our starting point. On our way up there, the Yankee cavalry followed us to see how we were getting along with the flanking business. We had pontoons made for the purpose of crossing streams. When we would get to a stream, the pontoons would be thrown across, and Hood's army would cross. Yank would halloo over and say, Well, Johnny, have you got everything across, yes, would be the answer. Well, we want these old pontoons, as you will not need them again. And they would take them. We passed all those glorious battlefields that have been made classic in history. Frequently coming across the skull of some poor fellow sitting on top of a stump. Also the bones of horses along the road, and fences burned and destroyed, and occasionally the charred remains of a once fine dwelling house. Outside of these occasional reminders, we could see no evidence of the desolation of the track of an invading army. The country looked like it did at first. Citizens came out and seemed glad to see us and would divide their onions, garlic, and leek with us. The soldiers were in good spirits, but it was the spirit of innocence and peace not war and victory. Where the railroads would cross a river, a blockhouse had been erected, and the bridge was guarded by a company of Federals. But we always flanked these little affairs. We wanted bigger and better meat. We captured Dalton. When we arrived at Dalton, we had a desire to see how the old place looked. Not that we cared anything about it, but we just wanted to take a last farewell look at the old place. We saw the United States flag flying from the ramparts, and thought that Yank would probably be asleep or catching lice. Or maybe engaged in a game of seven-up, so we sent forward a physician with some white bandages tied to the end of a long pole. He walked up and says, Hello, boys, what is it, boss? Well, boys, we've come for you. Hiya, ha, hiya, ha, hiya, ha, a he, 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 if it ain't old master, show. The place was guarded by Negro troops. We marched the black rascals out. They were mighty glad to see us and we were kindly disposed to them. We said, Now, boys, we don't want the Yankees to get mad at you and to blame you, so just let's get out here on the railroad track. 
and tear it up, and pile up the crosties, and then pile the iron on top of them, and we will set the thing afire. And when the Yankees come back they will say, What a bully fight them Nagers did make. A Yankee always says Nager, Reader, you should have seen how that old railroad did flop over, and how the darkies did sweat, and how the perfume did fill the atmosphere. But there were some Yankee soldiers in a blockhouse at Ringgold Gap who thought they would act big. They said that Sherman had told them not to come out of that blockhouse. Anyhow, but General William B. Bate begun to persuade the gentlemen by sending a few four-pound parrot feelers. All those feelers, they persuaded eloquently. They persuaded effectually those feelers did. The Yanks soon surrendered. The old place looked natural-like, only it seemed to have a sort of graveyard loneliness about it. A man in the well, on leaving Dalton after a day's march. We had stopped for the night. Our guns were stacked, and I started off with a comrade to get some wood to cook supper with. We were walking along, he a little in the rear, when he suddenly disappeared. I could not imagine what had become of him. I looked everywhere. The earth seemed to have opened and swallowed him. I called and called, but could get no answer. Presently I heard a groan that seemed to come out of the bowels of the earth, but, as yet, I could not make out where he was. Going back to camp, I procured a light, and after whooping and hallowing for a long time, I heard another groan this time much louder than before, the voice appeared to be overhead. There was no tree or house to be seen, and then again the voice seemed to answer from under the ground, in a hollow, sepulchral tone, but I could not tell where he was. But I was determined to find him, so I kept on hallowing and he answering. I went to the place where the voice appeared to come out of the earth. I was walking along rather thoughtlessly and carelessly, when one inch more, and I would have disappeared also. Right before me I saw the long dry grass all bending toward a common center, and I knew that it was an old well, and that my comrade had fallen in it. But how to get him out was the unsolved problem. I ran back to camp to get assistance, and everybody had a great curiosity to see the man in the well. They would get chunks of fire and shake over the well, and, peeping down, would say, Well, he's in there, and go off, and others would come and talk about his being in there. The poor fellow stayed in that well all night. The next morning we got a long rope from a battery and let it down in the well, and soon had him on terra firma. He was worse scared than hurt. Tuscumbia, we arrived and remained at Tuscumbia several days, awaiting the laying of the pontoons across the Tennessee River at Florence, Alabama, and then we all crossed over. While at Tuscumbia, John Branch and I saw a nice sweet potato patch that looked very tempting to a hungry rebel. We looked all around, and thought that the coast was clear. We jumped over the fence, and commenced grabbling for the sweet potatoes. I had got my haversack full, and had started off, when we heard, Halt, there. I looked around, and there was a soldier guard. We broke and run like quarter horses, 
and the guard pulled down on us just as we jumped the fence. I don't think his gun was loaded, though, because we did not hear the ball whistle. We marched from Dicature to Florence. Here the pontoon bridges were nicely and beautifully stretched across the river. We walked over this floating bridge and soon found ourselves on the Tennessee side of Tennessee River. In driving a great herd of cattle across the pontoon, the front one got stubborn and the others crowding up all in one bulk broke the line that held the pontoon, and drowned many of the drove. We had beef for supper that night, en route for Columbia. And nightly we pitch our moving tent a day's march nearer home. How every pulse did beat and leap, and how every heart did throb with emotions of joy, which seemed nearly akin to heaven. When we received the glad intelligence of our onward march toward the land of promise and of our loved ones, the cold November winds coming off the mountains of the northwest were blowing right in our faces and nearly cutting us in two. We were inured to privations and hardships, had been upon every march, in every battle, in every skirmish. In every advance, in every retreat, in every victory, in every defeat. We had laid under the burning heat of a tropical sun, had made the cold, frozen earth our bed, with no covering save the blue canopy of heaven. Had braved dangers, had breasted floods, had seen our comrades slain upon our right and our left hand had heard guns that carried death in their missiles, had heard the shouts of the charge, had seen the enemy in full retreat and flying in every direction, had heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded and dying, had seen the blood of our countrymen dyeing the earth and enriching the soil, had been hungry when there was nothing to eat, had been in rags and tatters, we had marked the frozen earth with bloody and unshod feet, had been elated with victory and crushed by defeat, had seen and felt the pleasure of the life of a soldier, and had drank the cup to its dregs. Yes, we had seen it all, and had shared in its hopes and its fears, its love and its hate, its good and its bad its virtue and its vice, its glories and its shame. We had followed the successes and reverses of the flag of the lost cause through all these years of blood and strife. I was simply one of hundreds of thousands in the same fix. The tale is the same that every soldier would tell, except Jim Whitler. Jim had dodged about, and had escaped being conscripted until Hood's raid, he called it. Hood's army was taking up every able-bodied man and conscripting him into the army. Jim Whitler had got a position as overseer on a large plantation, and had about a hundred Negroes under his surveillance. The army had been passing a given point and Jim was sitting quietly on the fence looking at the soldiers. The conscripting squad nabbed him. Jim tried to beg off, but all entreaty was in vain. He wanted to go by home and tell his wife and children goodbye, and to get his clothes. It was no go, but, after a while, Jim says, Gentlemen, I, Ganny, the law, you see, Jim knowed the law. He didn't know B from a bull's foot in the spelling book. But he said, the law. Now, when anyone says anything about the law, everyone stops to listen. 
Jim says, Ah, Ganny, the law laying great stress upon the law allows every man who has twenty negroes to stay at home. Ah, Ganny, those old soldiers had long, long ago forgotten about that old law of the long gone past. But Jim had treasured it up in his memory, lo, these many years, and he thought it would serve him now. As it had, no doubt, frequently done in the past. The conscript officer said, Law or no law, you fall into line. Take this gun and cartridge box and march. Jim's spirits sank, his hopes vanished into air. Jim was soon in line and was tramping to the music of the march. He stayed with the company two days. The third day it was reported that the Yankees had taken position on the Murfreesboro Pike. A regiment was sent to the attack. It was Jim's regiment. He advanced bravely into battle. The mini balls began to whistle around his ears. The regiment was ordered to fire. He hadn't seen anything to shoot at, but he blazed away. He loaded and fired the second time, when they were ordered to retreat. He didn't see anything to run from, but the other soldiers began to run, and Jim run, too. Jim had not learned the word halt, and just kept on running. He run, and he run, and he run, and he kept on running until he got home, when he jumped in his door and shouted, Wuki Rhoda, I, Ganny, I've served four years in the rebel army. Chapter Roman 16 Battles in Tennessee, Columbia This is my own, my native land. Once more the Maury Greys are permitted to put their feet upon their native heath, and to revisit their homes and friends. After having followed their tattered and torn, and battle-riddled flag, which they had borne aloft for four long years. On every march, and in every battle, that had been fought by the Army of Tennessee, we were a mere handful of devoted braves who had stood by our colors when sometimes it seemed that God himself had forsaken us. But, parents, here are your noble and brave sons, and, ladies, four years ago you gave us this flag, and we promised you that we would come back with the flag as victors. Or we would come not at all. We have been true to our promise and our trust. On every battlefield the flag that you entrusted to our hands has been borne aloft by brave and heroic men. Amid shot and shell, bloody battle and death, we have never forsaken our colors. Are we worthy to be called the sons of old Maury County, or have we fought in vain? Have our efforts been appreciated? Or have four years of our lives been wasted while we were battling for constitutional government, the supremacy of our laws over centralization, and our rights, as guaranteed to us by the blood of our forefathers on the battlefields of the Revolution? It is for you to make up your verdict. If our lives as soldiers have been a failure, we can but bow our heads on our bosoms and say, surely. Four years of our lives have been given for naught, and our efforts to please you have been in vain. Yet, the invader's foot is still on our soil, but there beats in our bosoms the blood of brave and patriotic men and we will continue to follow our old and war-worn and battle-riddled flag until it goes down forever. The Maury Grays, commanded by Captain A. M. Looney, left Columbia 
four years ago, with 120 men. How many of those 120 original members are with the company today, just 12? Company H has 20 members, but some of this number had subsequently enlisted. But we 12 will stick to our colors till she goes down forever, and until five more of this number fall dead and bleeding on the battlefield. A fiasco, when we arrived in sight of Columbia, we found the Yankees still in possession of the town fortified and determined to resist our advance. We sent forward a feeler, and the feeler reports back very promptly, yes, the Yankees are there. Well, if that be the case, we will just make a flank movement. We turn off the main turnpike at J.E.R. Carpenters, and march through the Cedars, and cross Duck River at Davis Ferry. On pontoon bridges near Lowell's Mill, we pass on and cross Rutherford Creek, near Barracks Mill, about three o'clock in the afternoon. We had marched through fields in the heavy mud, and the men, weary and worn out, were just dragging themselves along. Passing by the old Union Seminary, and then by Mr. Fred Thompson's, until we came to the Rally Hill Turnpike, it being then nearly dark, we heard some skirmishing. But, exhausted as we were, we went into bivouac. The Yankees, it seems to me, might have captured the whole of us. But that is a matter of history. But I desire to state that no blunder was made by either Generals Cheatham or Stuart, neither of whom ever failed to come to time. Jeff Davis is alone responsible for the blunder. About two hours after sunup the next morning, we received the order to fall in, fall in, quick, make haste. Hurrah, promptly, men, each rank count two. By the right flank, quick time, march. Keep promptly closed up. Everything indicated an immediate attack. When we got to the turnpike near Spring Hill, lo and behold, wonder of wonders, the whole Yankee army had passed during the night. The bird had flown. We made a quick and rapid march down the turnpike, finding Yankee guns and knapsacks. And now and then a broken down straggler, also two pieces of howitzer cannon, and at least twenty broken wagons along the road. Everything betokened a rout, and a stampede of the Yankee army. Double quick, Forrest is in the rear, now for fun. All that we want to do now is to catch the blue-coated rascals. Ha ha, we all want to see the surrender. Ha ha, double quick, a rip, 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 weoof. Pant, pant, pant. First one man drops out and then another. The Yankees are routed and running, and Forrest has crossed Harpeth River in the rear of Franklin. Hurrah, men, keep closed up. We are going to capture Schofield. Forrest is in the rear, never mind the straggler and cannon. Kerflop we come against the breastworks at Franklin. Franklin, the death angel gathers its last harvest. Kind reader, write here my pen and courage, and ability fail me. I shrink from butchery. Would to God I could tear the page from these memoirs, and from my own memory. It is the blackest page in the history of the War of the Lost Cause. It was the bloodiest battle of modern times in any war. 
It was the finishing stroke to the independence of the Southern Confederacy. I was there. I saw it. My flesh trembles and creeps and crawls when I think of it today. My heart almost ceases to beat at the horrid recollection. Would to God that I had never witnessed such a scene. I cannot describe it. It beggars description. I will not attempt to describe it. I could not. The death angel was there to gather its last harvest. It was the grand coronation of death. But I feel, though I did so, that page would still be there, teeming with its scenes of horror and blood. I can only tell of what I saw. Our regiment was resting in the gap of a range of hills, in plain view of the city of Franklin. We could see the battle flags of the enemy waving in the breeze. Our army had been depleted of its strength by a forced march from Spring Hill, and stragglers lined the road. Our artillery had not yet come up, and could not be brought into action. Our cavalry was across Harpeth River, and our army was but in poor condition to make an assault. While resting on this hillside, I saw a courier dash up to our commanding general, B. F. Chief M., and the word, attention, was given. I knew then that we would soon be in action. Forward march. We passed over the hill and through a little skirt of woods. The enemy were fortified right across the Franklin Pike in the suburbs of the town. Right here in these woods a detail of skirmishers was called for. Our regiment was detailed. We deployed as skirmishers, firing as we advanced on the left of the turnpike road. If I had not been a skirmisher on that day, I would not have been writing this today, in the year of our Lord 1882. It was four o'clock on that dark and dismal December day when the line of battle was formed, and those devoted heroes were ordered forward to strike for their altars and their fires, for the green graves of their sires, for God and their native land. As they marched on down through an open field toward the rampart of blood and death, the Federal batteries began to open and mow down and gather into the garner of death. As brave and good and pure spirits as the world ever saw, the twilight of evening had begun to gather as a precursor of the coming blackness of midnight darkness that was to envelop a scene so sickening and horrible that it is impossible for me to describe it. Forward, men, is repeated all along the line. A sheet of fire was poured into our very faces, and for a moment we halted as if in despair. As the terrible avalanche of shot and shell laid low those brave and gallant heroes, whose bleeding wounds attested that the struggle would be desperate, forward, men, the air loaded with death-dealing missiles. Never on this earth did men fight against such terrible odds. It seemed that the very elements of heaven and earth were in one mighty uproar. Forward, men, and the blood spurts in a perfect jet from the dead and wounded. The earth is red with blood. It runs in streams, making little rivulets as it flows. Occasionally there was a little lull in the storm of battle, as the men were loading their guns, and for a few moments it seemed as if night tried to cover the scene with her mantle. The deaf angel shrieks and laughs, and old Father Time is busy with his sickle, as he gathers in the last harvest of death. 
crying more, 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 while his rapacious maw is glutted with the slain. But the skirmish line being deployed out, extending a little wider than the battle did passing through a thicket of small locusts, where Brown, orderly sergeant of Company B, was killed, we advanced on toward the breastworks on and on. I had made up my mind to die felt glorious. We pressed forward until I heard the terrific roar of battle open on our right. Cliburn's division was charging their works. I passed on until I got to their works and got over on there the Yankee side. But in fifty yards of where I was the scene was lit up by fires that seemed like hell itself. It appeared to be but one line of streaming fire. Our troops were upon one side of the breastworks, and the Federals on the other. I ran up on the line of works, where our men were engaged. Dead soldiers filled the entrenchments. The firing was kept up until after midnight, and gradually died out. We passed the night where we were, but when the morrow's sun began to light up the eastern sky with its rosy hues, and we looked over the battlefield, oh my God, what did we see? It was a grand holocaust of death. Death had held high carnival there that night. The dead were piled the one on the other all over the ground. I never was so horrified and appalled in my life. Horses, like men, had died game on the gory breastworks. General Adams' horse had his forefeet on one side of the works and his hind feet on the other. Dead. The general seems to have been caught so that he was held to the horse's back, sitting almost as if living riddled and mangled and torn with balls. General Cleburne's mare had her four feet on top of the works. Dead in that position, General Cleburne's body was pierced with forty-nine bullets, through and through. General Strahl's horse lay by the roadside and the general by his side, both dead and all his staff, General Gist, a noble and brave cavalier from South Carolina, was lying with his sword reaching across the breastworks still grasped in his hand. He was lying there dead, all dead, they sleep in the graveyard yonder at Ashwood, almost in sight of my home. Where I am writing today, they sleep the sleep of the brave, we love and cherish their memory. They sleep beneath the ivy-mantled walls of St. John's Church, where they expressed a wish to be buried. The private soldier sleeps where he fell, piled in one mighty heap. Four thousand five hundred privates, all lying side by side in death. Thirteen generals were killed and wounded. 4,500 men slain, all piled and heaped together at one place. I cannot tell the number of others killed and wounded. God alone knows that. We will all find out on the morning of the final resurrection. Kind friends, I have attempted in my poor and feeble way to tell you of this I can hardly call it battle. It should be called by some other name, but, like all other battles, it, too, has gone into history. I leave it with you, I do not know who was to blame. It lives in the memory of the poor old rebel soldier who went through that trying and terrible ordeal. We shed a tear for the dead. They are buried and forgotten. We meet no more on earth, but up yonder, beyond the sunset and the night, 
away beyond the clouds and tempest, away beyond the stars that ever twinkle and shine in the blue vault above us, away yonder by the great white throne, and by the river of life, where the Almighty and Eternal God sits, surrounded by the angels and archangels and the redeemed of earth. We will meet again and see those noble and brave spirits who gave up their lives for their country's cause that night at Franklin, Tennessee. A life given for one's country is never lost. It blooms again beyond the grave in a land of beauty and of love. Hanging around the throne of sapphire and gold, a rich garland awaits the coming of him who died for his country. And when the horologue of time has struck its last note upon his dying brow, justice hands the record of life to mercy. And mercy pleads with Jesus and God, for his sake, receives him in his eternal home beyond the skies at last and forever. Nashville. A few more scenes, my dear friends, and we close these memoirs. We march toward the city of Nashville. We camp the first night at Brentwood. The next day we can see the fine old building of solid granite looming up on Capitol Hill, the capital of Tennessee. We can see the stars and stripes flying from the dome. Our pulse leaps with pride when we see the grand old architecture. We can hear the bugle call and the playing of the bands of the different regiments in the federal lines. Now and then a shell is thrown into our midst from Fort Negley, but no attack or demonstrations on either side. We bivouac on the cold and hard frozen ground, and when we walk about, the echo of our footsteps sound like the echo of a tombstone. The earth is crusted with snow, and the wind from the northwest is piercing our very bones. We can see our ragged soldiers with sunken cheeks and famine glistening eyes. Where were our generals? Alas, there were none. Not one single general out of Chetham's division was left, not one. General B. F. Chetham himself was the only surviving general of his old division. Nearly all our captains and colonels were gone. Companies mingled with companies, regiments with regiments, and brigades with brigades. A few raw-boned horses stood shivering under the ice-covered trees, nibbling the short, scanty grass. Being in range of the Federal guns from Fort Negley, we were not allowed to have fires at night and our thin and ragged blankets were but poor protection against the cold, raw blasts of December whether the coldest ever known. The cold stars seem to twinkle with unusual brilliancy, and the pale moon seems to be but one vast heap of frozen snow, which glimmers in the cold gray sky, and the air gets colder by its coming, our breath, forming in little rays, seems to make a thousand little coruscations that scintillate in the cold, frosty air. I can tell you nothing of what was going on among the generals. But there we were, and that is all that I can tell you. One morning about daylight our army began to move. Our division was then on the extreme right wing, and then we were transferred to the left wing. The battle had begun. We were continually moving to our left. We would build little temporary breastworks, then we would be moved to another place. Our lines kept on widening out and stretching further and further apart 
until it was not more than a skeleton of a skirmish line from one end to the other. We started at a run. We cared for nothing. Not more than a thousand yards off, we could see the Yankee cavalry. Artillery and infantry, marching apparently still further to our left. We could see regiments advancing at double quick across the fields, while, with our army, everything seemed confused. The private soldier could not see into things. It seemed to be somewhat like a flock of wild geese when they have lost their leader. We were willing to go anywhere, or to follow anyone who would lead us. We were anxious to flee, fight, or fortify. I have never seen an army so confused and demoralized. The whole thing seemed to be tottering and trembling. When, halt, front, right dress, and Adjutant McKinney reads us the following order. Soldiers, the commanding general takes pleasure in announcing to his troops that victory and success are now within their grasp. And the commanding general feels proud and gratified that in every attack and assault the enemy have been repulsed. And the commanding general will further say to his noble and gallant troops, Be of good cheer, all is well. General John B. Hood, General Commanding, Kinlock Falconer, Acting Adjutant General. I remember how this order was received. Every soldier said, Oh, shucks, that is all shenanigan, for we knew that we had never met the enemy or fired a gun outside of a little skirmishing. And I will further state that that battle order announcing success and victory, was the cause of a greater demoralization than if our troops had been actually engaged in battle. They at once mistrusted General Hood's judgment as a commander, and every private soldier in the whole army knew the situation of affairs. I remember when passing by Hood, how feeble and decrepit he looked, with an arm in a sling, and a crutch in the other hand, and trying to guide and control his horse, and, reader, I was not a Christian then, and am but little better today. But, as God sees my heart tonight, I prayed in my heart that day for General Hood, Poor fellow, I loved him, not as a general, but as a good man. I knew when that army order was read, that General Hood had been deceived, and that the poor fellow was only trying to encourage his men. Every impulse of his nature was but to do good, and to serve his country as best he could. Ah, reader, some day all will be well. We continued marching toward our left, our battle line getting thinner and thinner. We could see the Federals advancing, their blue coats and banners flying, and could see their movements and hear them giving their commands. Our regiment was ordered to double quick to the extreme left wing of the army, and we had to pass up a steep hill and the dead grass was wet and as slick as glass, and it was with the greatest difficulty that we could get up the steep hillside. When we got to the top, we as skirmishers were ordered to deploy still further to the left. Billy Carr and J.E. Jones, two as brave soldiers as ever breathed the breath of life in fact, it was given up that they were the bravest and most daring men in the Army of Tennessee and myself. were on the very extreme left wing of our army. While we were deployed as skirmishers, I heard, Surrender. Surrender, and on looking around us I saw that we were right in the midst of a Yankee line of battle. 
They were lying down in the bushes, and we were not looking for them so close to us. We immediately threw down our guns and surrendered. J. E. Jones was killed at the first discharge of their guns, when another Yankee raised up and took deliberate aim at Billy Carr and fired, the ball striking him below the eye and passing through his head. As soon as I could, I picked up my gun, and as the Yankee turned, I sent a mini ball crushing through his head and broke and run. But I am certain that I killed the Yankee who killed Billy Carr, but it was too late to save the poor boy's life. As I started to run, a fallen dogwood tree tripped me up, and I fell over the log. It was all that saved me. The log was riddled with balls, and thousands, it seemed to me, passed over it. As I got up to run again, I was shot through the middle finger of the very hand that is now penning these lines. And the thigh, that I had just killed a Yankee and was determined to get away from there as soon as I could. How I did get back I hardly know, for I was wounded and surrounded by Yankees. One rushed forward, and placing the muzzle of his gun in two feet of me discharged it, but it missed its aim. When I ran at him, grabbed him by the collar, and brought him off a prisoner, Captain Joe P. Lee and Colonel H. R. Field remember this, as would Lieutenant Colonel John L. House were he alive, and all the balance of Company H, who were there at the time. I had eight bullet holes in my coat, and two in my hand, beside the one in my thigh and finger. It was a hailstorm of bullets. The above is true in every particular, and is but one incident of the war, which happened to hundreds of others. But, alas, all our valor and victories were in vain, when God and the whole world were against us. Billy Carr was one of the bravest and best men I ever knew. He never knew what fear was, and in consequence of his reckless bravery, had been badly wounded at Perryville. Murfreesboro, Chickamauga, the Octagon House, Dead Angle, and the 22nd of July at Atlanta. In every battle he was wounded, and finally in the very last battle of the war, surrendered up his life for his country's cause, no father and mother of such a brave and gallant boy should ever sorrow or regret having borne to them such a son. He was the flower and chivalry of his company. He was as good as he was brave. His bones rest yonder on the Overton Hills today, while I have no doubt in my own mind that his spirit is with the Redeemer of the hosts of heaven. He was my friend. Poor boy, farewell. When I got back to where I could see our lines, it was one scene of confusion and rout. Finney's Florida Brigade had broken before a mere skirmish line, and soon the whole army had caught the infection. Had broken and were running in every direction. Such a scene I never saw. The army was panic-stricken. The woods everywhere were full of running soldiers. Our officers were crying, halt, halt, and trying to rally and reform their broken ranks. The Federals would dash their cavalry in amongst us, and even their cannon joined in the charge. One piece of Yankee artillery galloped past me, right on the road unlimbered their gun, fired a few shots, and galloped ahead again. 
whose whole army was routed and in full retreat. Nearly every man in the entire army had thrown away his gun and accoutrements. More than 10,000 had stopped and allowed themselves to be captured, while many, dreading the horrors of a northern prison, kept on, and I saw many, yea, even thousands, broken down from sheer exhaustion, with despair and pity written on their features. Wagon trains, cannon, artillery, cavalry, and infantry were all blended in inextricable confusion. Broken down and jaded horses and mules refused to pull, and the badly scared drivers looked like their eyes would pop out of their heads from fright. Wagon wheels, interlocking each other, soon clogged the road, and wagons, horses, and provisions were left indiscriminately. The officers soon became affected with the demoralization of their troops, and rode on in dogged indifference. General Frank Cheatham and General Loring tried to form a line at Brentwood, but the line they formed was like trying to stop the current of Duck River with a fish net. I believe the army would have rallied, had there been any colors to rally to. And as the straggling army moves on down the road, Every now and then we can hear the sullen roar of the Federal artillery booming in the distance. I saw a wagon and team abandoned, and I unhitched one of the horses and rode on horseback to Franklin, where a surgeon tied up my broken finger and bandaged up my bleeding thigh. My boot was full of blood, and my clothing saturated with it. I was at General Hood's headquarters. He was much agitated and affected, pulling his hair with his one hand he had but one, and crying like his heart would break. I pitied him, poor fellow. I asked him for a wounded furlough, and he gave it to me. I never saw him afterward. I always loved and honored him and will ever revere and cherish his memory. He gave his life in the service of his country, and I know today he wears a garland of glory beyond the grave, where justice says well done, and mercy has erased all his errors and faults. I only write of the understrata of history, in other words, the private's history as I saw things then, and remember them now. The winter of 1864-5 was the coldest that had been known for many years. The ground was frozen and rough, and our soldiers were poorly clad, while many, yes, very many, were entirely barefooted. Our wagon trains had either gone on, we knew not whither, or had been left behind. Everything and nature, too, seemed to be working against us. Even the keen, cutting air that whistled through our tattered clothes and over our poorly covered heads seemed to lash us in its fury. The floods of waters that had overflowed their banks seemed to laugh at our calamity and to mock us in our misfortunes. All along the route were weary and footsore soldiers. The citizens seemed to shrink and hide from us as we approached them. And, to cap the climax, Tennessee River was overflowing its banks, and several Federal gunboats were anchored just below Muscle Shoals. Firing at us while crossing, the once proud army of Tennessee had degenerated to a mob. We were pinched by hunger and cold. While the winds pierced the old, ragged, gray-back rebel soldier to his very marrow. 
the clothing of many were hanging around them in shreds of rags and tatters, while an old slouched hat covered their frozen ears. Some were on old, raw-boned horses without saddles. Honorable Jefferson Davis perhaps made blunders and mistakes, but I honestly believe that he ever did what he thought best for the good of his country. And there never lived on this earth from the days of Hampton to George Washington, a purer patriot or a nobler man than Jefferson Davis. And, like Marius, grand even in ruins, Hood was a good man, a kind man, a philanthropic man, but he is both harmless and defenseless now. He was a poor general in the capacity of commander-in-chief. Had he been mentally qualified, his physical condition would have disqualified him. His legs and one of his arms had been shot off in the defense of his country. As a soldier, he was brave, good, noble, and gallant, and fought with the ferociousness of the wounded tiger, and with the everlasting grit of the bulldog, but as a general he was a failure in every particular. Our country is gone, our cause is lost. Actum est de Republica. Chapter Roman 17. The Surrender. The Last Act of the Drama. On the 10th day of May, 1861, our regiment, the 1st Tennessee, left Nashville for the Camp of Instruction. With 1,250 men, officers, and line, other recruits continually coming in swelled this number to 1,400. In addition to this major, Fulcher's battalion of four companies, with 400 men originally, was afterwards attached to the regiment, and the 27th Tennessee Regiment was afterwards consolidated with the 1st. And besides this, there were about 200 conscripts added to the regiment from time to time. To recapitulate, the 1st Tennessee, numbering originally 1250, recruited from time to time 150. Fulcher's Battalion 400, the 27th Tennessee, 1200, number of conscripts at the lowest estimate. 200 making the sum total 3,200 men that belonged to our regiment during the war. The above I think a low estimate. Well, on the 26th day of April 1865, General Joe E. Johnston surrendered his army at Greensboro, North Carolina. The day that we surrendered our regiment, it was a pitiful sight to behold. If I remember correctly, there were just 65 men in all, including officers, that were paroled on that day. Now, what became of the original 3,200? A grand army, you may say. 3,200 men. Only sixty-five left now. Reader, you may draw your own conclusions. Lacked just four days of four years from the day we were sworn in to the day of the surrender, and it was just four years and twenty-four days from the time that we left home for the army to the time that we got back again. It was indeed a sad sight to look at, the old 1st Tennessee Regiment, a mere squad of noble and brave men, gathered around the tattered flag that they had followed in every battle through that long war. It was so bullet-riddled and torn that it was but a few blue and red shreds that hung drooping while it, too, was stacked with our guns forever. Thermopylae had one messenger of defeat, but when General Joe E. 
Johnston surrendered the Army of the South. There were hundreds of regiments, yea, I might safely say thousands. It had not a representative on the 26th day of April, 1865. Our cause was lost from the beginning. Our greatest victories, Chickamauga and Franklin, were our greatest defeats. Our people were divided upon the question of union and secession. Our generals were scrambling for who ranked. The private soldier fought and starved and died for naught. Our hospitals were crowded with sick and wounded, but half provided with food and clothing to sustain life. Our money was depreciated to naught and our cause lost. We left our homes four years previous, amid the waving of flags and handkerchiefs and the smiles of the ladies. While the fife and drum were playing Dixie and the bonny blue flag, we bid farewell to home and friends. The bones of our brave southern boys lie scattered over our loved South. They fought for their country and gave their lives freely for that country's cause, and now they who survive sit. Like Marius amid the wreck of Carthage, sublime even in ruins. Other pens abler than mine will have to chronicle their glorious deeds of valor and devotion. In these sketches I have named but a few persons who fought side by side with me during that long and unholy war. In looking back over these pages, I ask where now are many whose names have appeared in these sketches. They are up yonder, and are no doubt waiting and watching for those of us who are left behind. And, my kind reader, the time is coming when we, too, will be called while the archangel of death is beating the long roll of eternity. And with us it will be the last reveal. God himself will sound the assembly on yonder beautiful and happy shore, where we will again have a grand reconfederation. We shed a tear over their flower-strewn graves. We live after them, we love their memory yet. But one generation passes away and another generation follows. We know our loved and brave soldiers, we love them yet. But when we pass away, the impartial historian will render a true verdict, and a history will then be written in justification and vindication of those brave and noble boys who gave their all in fighting the battles of their homes. Their country and their God, the United States has no north, no south, no east, no west. We are one and undivided. Adieu, my kind friends, soldiers, comrades, brothers, all. The curtain is rung down. The footlights are put out, the audience has all left and gone home, the seats are vacant, and the cold walls are silent. The gaudy tinsel that appears before the footlights is exchanged for the dress of the citizen. Coming generations and historians will be the critics as to how we have acted our parts. The past is buried in oblivion, the blood-red flag, with its crescent and cross, that we followed for four long, bloody and disastrous years, has been folded never again to be unfurled. We have no regrets for what we did, but we mourn the loss of so many brave and gallant men who perished on the field of battle and honor. I now bid you an affectionate adieu. But, in closing these memoirs, the scenes of my life pass in rapid review before me. In imagination, I am young again tonight. 
I feel the flush and vigor of my manhood am just 21 years of age. I hear the fife and drum playing Dixie and Bonnie Blue Flag. I see and hear our fire-eating stump orators tell of the right of secession and disunion. I see our fair and beautiful women waving their handkerchiefs and encouraging their sweethearts to go to the war. I see the marshalling of the hosts for glorious war. I see the fine banners waving and hear the cry everywhere. To arms, to arms, and I also see our country at peace and prosperous. Our fine cities look grand and gay. Our fields rich in abundant harvests. Our people happy and contented. All these pass in imagination before me. Then I look and see glorious war in all its splendor. I hear the shout and charge, the boom of artillery and the rattle of small arms. I see gaily dressed officers charging backwards and forwards upon their metalled war horses, clothed in the panoply of war. I see victory and conquest upon flying banners. I see our arms triumph in every battle. And, oh, my friends, I see another scene. I see broken homes and broken hearts. I see war in all of its desolation. I see a country ruined and impoverished. I see a nation disfranchised and maltreated. I see a commonwealth forced to pay dishonest and fraudulent bonds that were issued to crush that people. I see sycophants licking the boots of the country's oppressor. I see other and many wrongs perpetrated upon a conquered people. But maybe it is but the ghosts and phantoms of a dreamy mind, or the wind as it whistles around our lonely cabin home. The past is buried in oblivion. The mantle of charity has long ago fallen upon those who think differently from us. We remember no longer wrongs and injustice done us by anyone on earth. We are willing to forget and forgive those who have wronged and falsified us. We look up above and beyond all these petty groveling things and shake hands and forget the past. And while my imagination is like the weaver's shuttle, playing backward and forward through these two decades of time, I ask myself, are these things real? Did they happen? Are they being enacted today? Or are they the fancies of the imagination in forgetful reverie? Is it true that I have seen all these things, that they are real incidents in my life's history? Did I see those brave and noble countrymen of mine laid low in death and weltering in their blood? Did I see our country laid waste and in ruins? Did I see soldiers marching? The earth trembling and jarring beneath their measured tread? Did I see the ruins of smoldering cities and deserted homes? Did I see my comrades buried, and see the violet and wild flowers bloom over their graves? Did I see the flag of my country, that I had followed so long, furled to be no more unfurled forever? Surely they are but the vagaries of mine own imagination. Surely my fancies are running wild tonight. But, hush, I now hear the approach of battle. That low, rumbling sound in the west is the roar of cannon in the distance. That rushing sound is the tread of soldiers. That quick, lurid glare is the flash that precedes the cannon's roar. And listen, that loud report that makes the earth tremble and jar and sway is but the bursting of a shell as it screams through the dark, tempestuous night. That black, ebon cloud, where the lurid lightning flickers and flares, 
that is rolling through the heavens, is the smoke of battle. Beneath is being enacted a carnage of blood and death. Listen, the soldiers are charging now. The flashes and roaring now are blended with the shouts of soldiers and confusion of battle. But, reader, time has brought his changes since I, a young ardent and impetuous youth, burning with a lofty patriotism, first shouldered my musket to defend the rights of my country. Lifting the veil of the past, I see many manly forms, bright in youth and hope, standing in view by my side in Company H. First Tennessee Regiment Again I look and half those forms are gone. Again, and gray locks and wrinkled faces and clouded brows stand before me. Before me, too, I see, not in imagination, but in reality, my own loved Jenny, the partner of my joys and the sharer of my sorrows. Sustaining, comforting, and cheering my pathway by her benignant smile, pouring the sunshine of domestic comfort and happiness upon our humble home. Making life more worth the living as we toil, on up the hill of time together, with the bright pledges of our early and constant love by our side while the sunlight of hope ever brightens our pathway. Dispelling darkness and sorrow as we hand in hand approach the valley of the great shadow. The tale is told. The world moves on. The sun shines as brightly as before. The flowers bloom as beautifully. The birds sing their carols as sweetly. The trees nod and bow their leafy tops as if slumbering in the breeze. The gentle winds fan our brow and kiss our cheek as they pass by. The pale moon sheds her silvery sheen. The blue dome of the sky sparkles with the trembling stars that twinkle and shine and make night beautiful. And the scene melts and gradually disappears forever. The End Thanks for watching this video book is provided by Stream Books.